welcome to Movies and Tea. Tonight we are continuing our look at the history of the creature feature as we move on to Piranha 3D from 2017. Sorry, from 2010. Um, a film, an analogy of the dog-eat-dog world we live in, or perhaps how the rich prey on the communities of lo local tourist towns, perhaps, or... Maybe it's just an excuse to see lots of nudity and people getting attacked by killer piranha in this remake. Um, and officially the third film in the Piranha series, originally started by Joe Dante back in 1978 and produced by Roger Corman, followed up by Piranha 2 The Spawning, which also helped launch the career of one James Cameron. Um, before we now skip ahead to 2010, uh, for Piranha 3D, which sees the Piranha return once again, and this time in 3D, back for that brief craze of putting everything back into 3D that was the 2010s. I'm your host, as always, Edward Jones. Joining me, of course, is my co host, Miss Kim Lowe. Um, So, Kim, this is the first time watched for yourself, like all oh, the films in this tail end section of the season. It just watch a lot of drag, that's what it is. Hello. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean this is a this is a first watch, obviously, like the rest, because you know, my creature feature experience is fairly low compared to yours. <laughs> and mostly because I don't know, I either watch really crappy creature features or yeah. I focus mostly on shark films so it's uh it's really nice to to be watching like a variety because piranha is something that i've always wondered why i haven't dived into it more it could have been because you know i started on a crappy one that was three double d and it was just so ridiculous that i didn't really feel like diving into the other ones would be fun i guess mostly i don't know i i think it's also it's also the fact that um, when you think about Piranha, it's it's very repetitive, and that's how I felt a little about this one in the sense that, yeah, sure, there, there's no other way to do it than to make it really goofy and comedic because that kind of keeps it really entertaining to watch because, oh, you know, like this gets eaten or these people get whatever, and then the panic and all that stuff. It's, it's very, you know, it's very parallel to, say, a shark film, obviously. But at the same time, you know, when you're having a bunch of fish, their only job is to go into school and then feed, then it's kind of like going to school with fish <laughs> and then feed. It's very, um, you know, hmm. there's, there's only so much you can do with that. Um, obviously, Piranha 3D starts off in a way where I kind of like because it kind of gave you like an origin of where Piranha came from. So we had this whole... You know, like, oh, there was a tremor, and it's kind of like the Meg type of deal, where it was a tremor, and then it opens up a crevice, and then, you know, like, um, it then the, this massive pile of fish, the piranhas come out, and they're, you know, the whole story is that they're, they're what, Mesolithic or whatever, and it's, <laughs> and I think that that's kind of neat, because, well, obviously, these fish, that explains why they look the way they do, because, you know, they're, they're trapped under the, you know, under this lake, under a lake yeah. type of thing. Um, and it's, it's, you know, they have, they're, they're very, very aggressive in that sense where, you know, their nature has changed. And you kind of learn about it as the movie goes along. So that part of it was, was pretty fun. But essentially, I mean, <laughs> this is more categorized as, as bloody and gory as this gets. It is pretty much categorized as a comedy, I believe. So, so, and, and, you know, it is, it is very, um, funny in some parts, silly in others, goofy in other ones, you know, especially like the his 3D legs. scenes because, you know, 2010s, the 3D wasn't yeah, really he gets his legs that great. Around, you, it's so. very obvious when you yeah, watch a 3D I mean, also, movie is, uh, because the effects are so, remake of sorts. I don't know. It's like, weird because so it falls ridiculous. That, it's that kind of like going of back to Deep Blue Sea it could be with as both Samuel L. Jackson getting his... His, um, so his, this is directed by Alexandra you know, his, his Ajay, who is you know, one of the key directors of the new French extremity <laughs> yeah, the legs movement, off. a 
brief movement of French horror, which saw them tapping into the cinema de look movement, which was a follow on from the new French New Wave, uh, with directors like Luc Besson and films like Diva, the emphasis on style over substance. And with the new French extremity, it was these really gorgeous looking French horror movies, but at the same time, insanely violent and insanely bloody. We gave us movies like Inside, you got uh, Frontiers, Martyrs were all part of this movement, and Alexandra Auger contributed it with uh, the wonderful Switchblade Romance, we released as High Tension in the States before coming to the States and doing some really fantastic remakes. He first off did the Hills of Ice remake, he followed up with a remake of Mirrors. And he also produced the Elijah Wood uh, remake of Maniac, which was also pretty damn delightful, uh, with this one being seeing him once again stepping into the uh, director's chair to helm this uh, sequel, which really in many ways pays homage to his love of the series, as well as just horror movies in general, which is just clear throughout when you look at um, some of the sort of setup here. I mean, we open with... Richard Dreyfus playing a fisherman who's there fishing away. He's drinking Amity beer and he's singing, show me the way to go home. It's like, how many Jaws references can we get in here? <laughs> um, before we obviously have the earthquake and this shoal of prehistoric piranha consume him um, in a wonderful sequence, which he has no idea what the film is about. He has no idea why people like 3D movies, and he just knows that he got paid for his two days' work on the film. <laughs> That's Richard Jefferson's takeaway from this film. But he was um, one of the one cameo they did get. They had originally planned to have both Joe Dante and um, James Cameron as, do a cameo as um, boat instructors, but James Cameron was too busy, even though Joe Dante wanted to do it. So sadly, that never happened, but... We, uh, yeah, we open with that wonderful nod to Jaws there. And even when you look at the poster, it's got it's just replicating the Jaws poster. You've got the girl on the lilo and you've got the swarm of piranha beneath her, which is pretty cool as well. But uh, this is set in, the, in a small town, um, which relies on the spring break dollars to stay afloat. And unfortunately, it seems that while you've got all these out-of-towners coming in, to uh, hang out and party on the lake, which is obviously a real bad time when you've got a shoal of killer piranha on the loose. Uh, we've also got Derek Jones, the uh, director of the Girls Gone Wild parody, Girls uh, Wild Wild Girls, uh, who's in uh, town as well to shoot shots for his new film. So, yeah, there's a lot of excuse just to have a lot of scanty clad people and a lot of nudity and a lot of violence, as Kim mentioned already. So... If you were, I think, you, like a teenage me, you probably would have. This would have been his favorite movie of all time, had it come out when I was a teenager. Yep. Well, I mean, it also helps that the film uh, for 2010, obviously, they also had some familiar TV faces, at least to me, because I watched the shows um, back in back then. Um, and, you know, you have Gossip Girl. Um, she was in Gossip Girl. Was oh, Jessica yeah. We, I mean, we got Sore, Elizabeth which Shue, Kelly. who was And in, then you um, also have uh, Vampire uh, Diaries. Was in who played, Las like, Vegas. Kind of a and supporting those actresses her main role. Like, never seem to um, which is really Stephen R. McQueen. Sort of get and the they basically are deserved. the I mean, main Adam Scott, female male lead here, if you can 90s. argue that, I guess. We've got Jerry um, Of the younger group, obviously, because you also have the cops. Probably his highlight is still Marcellus Wallace in Pulp Fiction. So, yes. and it's just a really, it's a really interesting cast when you look at some of the casting choices. We even get like Christopher Lloyd as a fish shopkeeper. Um, we do. Oh, what a surprise! Eli Roth playing a sleaze bag. Sure, that took a lot of effort for him. Yeah, he's he's the host of the um, the the wet t-shirt contest because, of course, he is. He does get a really cool death in this, so I'll give him that. 
Yeah, and you, we even have your favorite favorite director, Eli Roth, in a cameo role. <laughs> yep. <laughs> it, it is basically just Doc Brown, but if Doc Brown just ran a fish shop. <laughs> you just wait for him to go, Good Scott! <laughs> There's giant that, piranha that true, in the that lake! That is true. Um, I mean, and then we have that, uh, Christopher Lloyd... In I don't know. There's something about Christopher role, Lloyd. Whenever I see Christopher of, Lloyd uh, in anything, it's exciting. Channeling to, his Doctor Brown, see it's like so the taxi it is. Or, um, you catch him in something like a little more different, like when he's doing like <laughs> uh, things right? to do in Denver when you're dead, and it's like, oh my god, it's Christopher Lloyd, and he's in a gangster movie. Um, for the Brits, we also get Kelly Brook, who's the um, she's the brunette in the red bikini. She's a big deal over here. I don't think she's a big deal over in, in like Canada and that, so <laughs> Yeah, I mean she's paired up with Riley Steele who makes a whole different type of cinema. And which I mean it comes in handy. I mean if you're got if you're mm. doing a lot of filming where you require okay. your actresses to be naked, I mean it's either you go to Europe or Well I'm guessing you that's why she got the role the because her role is to, also a little bit bigger. To play as these well. roles for you. And I think a lot of people are she's very you know? good in this role. I mean she's got a very limited role, but she's entertaining enough. Um and we also get like she also plays a key part in like justifying why anyone would bother to see this movie in 3D. <laughs> it was one of two scenes in this whole movie people talked about in 3D. I mean, this is this is <laughs> this is the thing when we talk about these movies where it's like just gratuitous TNA. It's all like everyone's like, oh, it's just like. It's just like young boys who want to see like boobs and stuff, and it's like I know quite a few lesbians who are also watching Basically, this. I don't just I say mean, it's just a, that, young boys who are watching this because my uh, my friend she was also responsible for my well, copy. I mean, they also A1. bring in a different demographic, right? But in all this <laughs> chaos, we've got uh, small town boy Jake, his his friend slash crush Kelly, has returned from college for for the spring break. She's uh, supposedly hooked up with this jackass of a. A douchey boyfriend, but he's mysteriously cut out the pit, the film rather quickly, um, and he's basically supposed to be babysitting for his younger siblings, but decides to skip out to go and shoot the girls gone wild wild video because that seems yeah. like a much more fun afternoon than mm -hmm. looking after your uh, younger siblings. Yeah, exactly. So his plot line is like one half of this. And then the other half, we've obviously got Sheriff Julie, here played by Liz of a Shoe, who's just like a badass in beige. She knows how to handle herself, as we see early on in this film. And she's well, you trying know, to and figure out what the hell's like, going you know, the first on in, in the lake when they obviously pull out uh, Richard Dreyfuss' his, uh, mangled his corpse out of the river. Siblings, right? And I love the fact as well, they say, oh, do you think this could have been a speedboat? Another reference to Jaws there. And it's great that you have these two parallel sort of storylines that both sort of into either into each other coming together sort of at the end um, for the big big sort of finale where um, the boat that Jake's on is being being uh, attacked by these these Shola Piranha who have at this point finished like chowing down on all the townies. <laughs> Um, and I have to say, like when it came to like that big payoff, payoff sequence. So obviously, when we we did the Meg, we had the big beach sequence in the Meg, which was a lot of fun. And then again, we get to see a similar sequence here with with Piranha, where you've got all these townies um, in their boats and dicking around in the water because nobody ever wants to listen to the police <laughs> when they're saying get out of the water. They're just there to harsh their good time, and then we just have like this epic. This epic, like, uh, mm -hmm. water sequence, uh, which my wife actually complained that people just kept screaming, <laughs> carrying on when I had this going on in the background, so. Mm. Oh, 
<laughs> well, screaming seems like the normal thing to do. But, I mean, like, it also was able to bring in a lot of the gore because, obviously, there's a lot of bodies for you to chomp on and that's kind of the, the beauty of having creature features sometimes is the more bodies you see and the more gore you can deliver. And <laughs> um, that's part of the fun, as some would argue. <laughs> um so, you know, but and, and, you know, it gave you a lot of really ridiculous things and some really ridiculous moments. Oh, yes, Jerry O'Connell. <laughs> like, some of the scenes were, you know, especially, yeah. I think it was it's for... It's funny because when um, we think of, like, Jerry O'Connell, we the remember The crystal being, character, like, which is Riley Steele, uh, you see, the like, good, the CGI, the boy, like, good, boob like, implants uh, floating up. Like, scientists and, and then you have one and where and I can't remember if it was... Like, um, completely against type because he's oh, just was like it, sleazy it, was it, uh, was it girls the gone Jerry O'Connell's like, part or I can't remember that one or Eli Roth where his penis gets the fact that when he gets regurgitated uh, his main concern um, is the fact his penis has been chewed off um, and his final words are wet t-shirts Oh, yeah, like, yeah. I know what you were saying. <laughs> it's, it's just weird because in my mind, I really thought I remembered seeing Jerry O'Connell in, like, really bad roles. Like, as a bad person or, like, a really crappy type of character, you know, like. Not, not like, the character he played. Like, he did a bad job. But, like, the character he played was not a good person type of thing. He was the. So I can't like. Kind of it's like also an one of those people that I can't really pinpoint two. exactly um, where I saw him. He was in him. Joe's apartment, which is so even when I'm looking through the his, 90s his, where he his hangs IMDb out with talking cockroaches. Whatnot, I'm like pinpointing certain uh, things. He was also in Stand by Me. Some things are kind of escaping me, That's and like I'm like, oh, well, some of these movies like Will kind of make and, sense, you know? Like uh, I guess Phoenix, I've seen Corey Feldman. It was like weird when you look at like. The four lead roles in Stand By Me, and they all went on to like have like amazing careers. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, apart from Reverend Phoenix, who have sadly died outside the uh, Viper Room, and Corey Fieldman, who <laughs> is kind of self sabotaging his own career. Okay. Um, but yeah, it's, like I said, I know what you're saying. I'm trying to look at the roles he's played in, and nothing okay. that I can. It's like jumping out at me as him playing like a bad character. There's a lot of bad movies he's been in. Like Fat Slags from 2004. Um, and then he's done a lot of voice work as uh, Clark Kent Superman. Okay. Yeah, he's the, he seems to be the go-to guy for um, DC Animated. Um, for, doing the, for doing the <laughs> Clark Kent. He's also doubled in doing Captain Marvel as well. So he's doing a lot of voice work, which you know is good work if you can get it. Yeah, I know he, he, he was in the he was in the sit around the, the recording the, booth and have some tea. I think and Justice stuff, so. League Dark or something like that. You don't have to really worry about working out or anything. So, oh, he's in Billions as well, which is good. So. <laughs> Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, so I mean like like the point the point being is that like, you know, going back to the movie is really, you know, the 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 little moments like that, even in all the gore and all you know, the CGI floating penis and all that stuff. It's it, it has it, it it kind of brings in all that goof factor, but at the same time it 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 kind of ties in well with the type of you know yeah film that they're trying to do where there's a lot of nudity and it makes sense for all these things to be happening and it kind of gives you a little chuckle when these things like happen because you know you never ex you know you're not going to expect oh you know the 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 big boob lady is going to have a boob transplant floating across the screen or something you know and that was that was kind of that was kind of a, a fun little moment i think 
Um, where, where is something like I think the film does a good yeah, job. Yeah, I mean, definitely like, free double D with the it's a piranha fine line in the water between park. Something being really um, ridiculous right from the, the whole setup where it's like um, a this one was water still park, acceptable. Which is staffed where, by like you know, strippers. Like when you talk it was about just, three double it was, D, it was the storyline like at points just was so ridiculous far. that you know. That it, um, it kind of like right went really, a little overboard. Like, that in in the sense that it felt like it didn't make much sense. Way too much. Where this one's still grounded. I mean, it's. I'm not going to say it's necessarily scary. It's certainly gory, which is certainly what we should have expected from Alexander Azure because that's sort of what he does. And I think perhaps because this the plot line is so daft that that's why he just decided to just ramp up the gore rather than trying to make it like super tense. Even though there are a couple of like sort of like uh, tense moments in there such as like when you've got these divers that swim into like the uh, the nest of these piranha and um, they like pull out the flare and it's like suddenly surrounded by piranha it's um, it, but even just with the the levels of gore there's always something like really surprising you see like someone getting their face stri- stripped off or um, or just like a lot of like mangled uh, corpses and stuff so Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think that that's where it's it's really, you know, especially that big epic scene where they're at that dock and all these things are, are you know, all the impalanas yeah. <laughs> are attacking them and trying to pull the bodies out of the water. And it's just like a really big scene where, you know, you see how the piranhas are attacking in a certain way where certain people are bitten here, bitten there. And, and as you pull the bodies out, you can really see the gore and, and like, who's going to make it out, who's not oh, going to yeah, make you, it out. If you're out. squeamish, then, you know, then I think this one's going to be... carrying the girl and she's just Gives you a nasty you know? jolt. Like, it's... There's and a lot of these little things when we that get happen, to the big massacre sequence it, it here. Really it knows, delivers on like, that level. Knows um, which, it still isn't, you know, How to like keep said, the audience's attention there, because there's only so many se, times you can watch people be like, mauled by Piranha. So he inserts, like, these action like beats this, in there. So I guess we get Adam Scott on a jet ski driving around shooting Piranha with a shotgun. We get, like, Ving Rames using the outboard propeller to, like, dice up Piranha. Um, and we we get like the collapse of the stage because all the you got all the uh, townies trying to. Cl- I don't. This, this is what I never get. You got more clambering on there. Nobody ever yeah. thinks to go to the back. <laughs> yeah. It does. It's the exact same shot, isn't it? So yeah. it is the, pretty much the exact same shot that they use there, um, and then we uh, uh, then we. Just I know get it was it was on top of that. It like was like whose face it, you know what that scene of the thing gets, like, falling over and people dropping down was, reminded me of it, Titanic. I think <laughs> it's been so like, the point inspiration. Where it just so you can't help but just laugh at this, um, or switch it off. You've probably got one of either two ways with this, but. <laughs> I just, as I said, I just had a really fun time with this one. Um, it just, it takes what was so good about the Dante original and just sort of like uses the yeah freedom that he obviously has with having like a budget 11 times the size of what Dante had. Because Dante, as you pointed out before we came on, had a budget of 1 million and Aja has a budget of 12 million. <laughs> oh, Roger Corman. Never one to like skimp on his productions. Um, so yeah, but this one turned a big profit. The TV shots were um, Azure actually shot scenes which aren't in the movie, just for use in the trailer. Um, he also did a fake trailer they where it at, said that the film 000? should be nominated for Academy Awards. <laughs> Which is up there with Jackass um, doing their trailer where they just took negative reviews from the critics and put it in like a positive slant. Um, such as, this film marks the end of all humanity. <laughs> uh, but with the, with the whole massacre sequence, that's when you look at the complexity. I mean, it took nine days <laughs> to shoot it. There's 1,112 boats in there. 
which is just insane to think about. And Eli, Eli um, Roth managed to catch an, an eye infection because of the, <laughs> using the wrong suntan lotion. So, what I mean overall, I mean I saw that you marked this a lot lower than I did on that box, so I was sort of dreading the worst coming into this episode of what you made of it. So, uh, did you have any fun with it or? <laughs> I you know the, the deal is that I think it all it all it all derives down to my main point uh when I first started talking about this is that I just don't find piranhas to be thrilling um yeah, they're, you know, they're killing machines and stuff like that. Um, and they do have kind of a decent backstory to it. But overall, the film, I think for me, like while okay. some of the parts I thought were pretty clever, if say you appreciated that type of humor, um, I, I it kind of wore thin on me over time. I kind of felt like for a movie that was running like fairly decent runtime at like an hour and a half or something, an hour 40 minutes or something. I felt it. It was kind of like some some of the parts were just really, um, you know, been there, done that. You know, a lot of movies that are done in this way is is done like that. Um, I mean, I appreciate the gore. I appreciate the the things like you know. I I think that the things I liked about Aja, yeah. um, as we you know, obviously when we look at Crawl later on, um, I'm gonna bring that up. Whereas that type of horror, I like a little bit more where it's, you know, there's a little bit more seriousness to it. But I also, you know, I think it's just a personal preference. I think I, do, I honestly, when I was thinking about it, um, I just think that Piranha is, you know, it's kind of like sharks. You can go both ways with shark films, just like you can go, you know, like piranhas. Like, can you do it another way? Like, what other setting would you have a piranha attack other than at, you know, a beach or a spring break or something like that. And, you know, at the same time, it's it's also the fact that we had a, like, me and my husband, we had a whole discussion about this where, like, spring break is this concept to me, um, which is so foreign because I don't know if it's just because Canada is not so crazy when it comes to spring break um, or the fact that I just think it's, I know what you're Super saying. Super ridiculous. It's, it's funny to that watch. They, and as I get older, use, these um, scenes kind of like the girls the gone wild. So I was thinking while I was watching this, it's like really when bothers those, me sometimes. Those tapes like first came um, out. This was where like, you know you have all these things like happening. Like, oh my gosh! Why are they doing this? You know, why are they being idiots? Girls being convinced. And you're just sitting there. You don't know whether you should be frustrated or you should be laughing. Now we have access to so much worse. But at the same at the time, these were like the most scandalous things ever. So. It was a weird throwback that they decided to work that in. But again, I just suppose it ties in with this whole spring break thing. Because we don't have spring break here um, in in the UK. But I think it's because we don't... We have a lower drinking age. And I think that's the whole point of spring break is to go places where you can go and get drunk. Um, leave more in legally or something. What age do you have to be to drink in, in Canada? Same as us. Um, and you also don't have the weird rule in strip clubs where you can't serve alcohol and nu have nudity in the same place. In America, you can either have alcohol and uh, no, no nudity. I or guess. You can have nudity I mean, no we all, I mean our, our drinking rule. age, I think, is, our drinking age is yeah. also lower than the state. In States, Canada, so, you can suck back um, a cold one while watching some lumberjack's daughter strip down 18. to a pelt. Yeah. <laughs> Why Why be in America? Go to Canada. All the cool kids are up in Canada. It's cold, but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> go, go and see all the exotic sites like Ontario and Quebec and Toronto. <laughs> 
And, uh, well, Nova it's not Scotia. cold everywhere, so you just choose the place that you want to go. The place, just the places that aren't cold, is that uh, inflation is incredibly higher, so the cost yeah. of living is also higher. So, uh, so it's, it's up to you, you know. <laughs> but, but I mean, like, yeah, go. Yeah, so no, but that's that's the main thing for for you know Piranha being rated low is mostly because I just I just think that the whole concept is very repetitive. Um, I think I think it also has to do with you know the previous movie we watched, um, Deep Rising. I just thought that was so much more, you know, fun <laughs> to watch <laughs> because there was a lot more variety. There was a lot more you know. Um, uh, a lot more, I guess, just when you talk about it, it was a lot more action, a lot more moving around. Here is just a lot of, you know, gratuitous nudity type of thing. And um, I just, I think I'm just a little bit bored by that once you go on for that for too long. And it felt like, well, you already had that. So you already have it on the beach setting. Well, why would you have it on this whole like filming crew out in the middle of the lake yeah. type of thing? Um, it felt like it was just a double of just trying to sell this really, really well. But, you know, I obviously I didn't know a little a few things, you know, like, you know, the whole Riley Steele detail, <laughs> which kind of legitimizes this a little. Um, and and I mean, I, I really like the lake sequence, despite, you know, like when things started going bad, it became fun to watch because the other part just felt really stupid, like the whole like, oh, Kelly and. And what, what was his name? Uh, J uh, Jake. <laughs> like the whole thing felt stupid there, and then the whole like a lot of the a lot of the little side yeah, plots sure. felt like this it film was is really included in the top ten horror franchises with the most um, female like nude would, scenes. It, would, it didn't make any uh, according sense to, to the there, website but, Mr. Skin. I, mean, I understand it's a creature feature. Nudity so in films. These things are exactly your main focus. Uh, it just uh, has witchcraft to be there is and, the top one with seventy seven. Friday the Thirteenth had forty nine. Hellraiser had twenty four. To give it to give these characters a little bit more substance. Hostel fourteen. Silent Dead Night four. 14, Halloween 14 and Amityville 9 so there's your top 10 horror franchises if you want to see naked ladies what I loved about uh, the Meg was that whole beach sequence at the end uh, how did I mean how did that compare to this because I mean again that's another another sort of chaotic sequence but obviously it's just one big shark it's not just a swarm of uh, piranha um <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I I have you know honestly I have no problem with that big scene. I I think that in he both does, the true. Meg he doesn't or get to the, do a or, or, of, um, the action hero so I, I think, think that that was really the that, strong point that the moment because normally he just plays like, um, a lot like of the the finale itself and was very and strong and in the sense that you know you um, had all these characters like really playing, like, you know breaking out of character you know especially with Adam Scott jumping out and you know with the jet ski with his gun and that seems to be his like you see him do all the he settled into in life so yeah <laughs> yeah i mean and 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 I, and that i think that's like the really strong point and when you compare it to the meg it it's you know these scenes on the beach and stuff like that with massive panic and that sort of thing it is always i think a highlight in a film because that's that's your that's the peak moment that's your climax of the film and and that's where it really becomes the film and it comes together because you know you have the action it's not just being stupid um you know like and and i i really like these scenes a lot so those are you know i had i can't really compare the two i really think that both are very enjoyable oh yeah i mean obviously right. i have so. a bias this thing because i remember like um, following the meg for like all the years it was like in development I like them more in general you have them like um, 
so you have, like, the shot, basically, the I guess if you were to say that, him. probably the Meg, because, uh, you know, the movie's like the, poster the for the Meg the was the big shadow shark, shark at the bottom with, the like, Meg the beach, it, right? So, so um, that kind of sold the me already. With the problem is with the shark jaw is the fact that the likes of the Asylum and these sort of budget companies have just churned out so many bad shark movies. It's hard to, like, get excited by, by shark movies um, anymore, unless we're obviously going back to, like, the old school ones, you know, like Jaws and uh, The Last Shark, Mako, Jaws of yeah. Death, things like that. Um, I just have a real real struggle getting into them. Because it just normally when I see a shark movie, it just means like bad CGI shark. Um, whereas for myself, I just looking for something I can connect with, get some like decent kills here. And I think with Piranha, especially because it's combined both like the CGI stuff as well as the old school effects. I mean, you see Greg Nicaro, um, who headed up the special effects. Um, on the film, you see him actually carrying half a corpse on the beach in a fun, wonderful cameo. But um, yeah, I did. Um, I never really thought about like where my preferred uh, beast is all the time we've been doing this season. I think it's just like it's always about the payoff um, and and whether the creature focus can uh, deliver that sort of good payoff. So. <laughs> yeah well I think it's just because for me it's a bit different a lot of people started horror on on a lot of, on a different footing yeah. right and for me i i remember being able to really start off on horror um completely other than you know the occasional ghost stories and stuff like that from um from from chinese films was was basically deep blue sea and creature features so for me it holds a really like shark films holds a really like special spot in my heart um, where it kind of has a bit of nostalgia. I always feel like those films are a little bit more. So if you were to say, oh, is it like something specifically like I just like all shark films? Well, that's not true because, you know, last <laughs> time um, when we did Shark Night, I kind of <laughs> was very, I was pretty yeah. negative about the film in general. Um, but, you know, at the same time, I don't have, you know, like I, th I like other creature features, right? And um, you talk about, you know, Crawl, later on when we talk about Crawl, I mean, I have massive love for that film. Um, I just hope the second viewing is going to still have that love for it. Um, and then you talk about, you know, like Lake Placid or something. I had a fun time with Lake Placid as well. Not so much Anaconda. Um, but, you know, like things like that, you you know, certain films like that, the, the bigger films is what I usually was able to watch. And obviously the season mm. has brought up a whole lot of other stuff. Uh, whether you know you talk about the older films to the newer ones, see, this is the, I think that's you thinking know when we talk about <laughs> when we get to the end of the I season, the, it could be a really the, interesting discussion to have, shark or even just a side discussion um, fear. on whether you know creatures. like what type of to, creatures to fear with them. makes a Piranha really good creature feature because now that we've looked at so many different ones, having this one big. I'm sorry to think spiders are really good, but they're just really many small things. Uh, which is what I think is the the scary factor of Piranha, and the fact that we all know the the old legends about Piranha, like stripping a man's but man to bones in seconds, sort of thing. You know, they've been you know, like when you see like the James Bond movies, like um, You Only Live Twice, where he's got the Piranha tank um, that he's just like stripping people down to bones and stuff. So, and I think yes. when we look at the other creature features, it, they they don't have that advantage. I mean, spiders are quite scary. Um, but it takes something clever to make them work because you just need to compare like Kingdom of Spiders to Arachnophobia to see how you do it well and how you do it really badly. Um, and snake, snakes are really difficult because snakes have got intelligence in their faces, so they um, they always come in off like like car in the Jungle Book when they try to do snakes like in Anaconda. So. Um, and then whatever the hell deep rising was, so but <laughs> mm. 
Yeah. Maybe it's just like Yeah, I think that, you know, that's the thing is like do you do you appreciate creatures being you know things that you know. Uh, but yeah, you know I think we're, that they're this is something we're or, or is there something to that's completely unknown to you, having that unknown out, factor, right? Or what just is a, a super-sized version, morph version of, so we still got of, a couple of, of something that you go. might think you know, um, or some ancient character is, creature, some right? And, you mentioned already with um, crow coming up. All those things I think come. I think all the things, all those things come into. To jump ahead, we also got the bay when you do something like this. On our next episode, which is another completely different uh creature feature type though as well so um yeah. what is it what 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 are the mechanics of this thing? Yeah, so I, I yeah, so I, I, I really think thing, that there's you know there's, the there's still a lot, you know, like it would be a really fun discussion stupid topic people to be, get, you know, uh, to, to bring on the table or even that, just that like was, discussion that's topic basically for what the slasher movies you know, descended the, into the it general more, it people listening or, or who the like and more about features, us like rooting what, for the killer. What they tend to, you know, gravitate towards. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, and 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 you know, for creature features, it also brings down to the point that you know, when when we were watching, um, I know that you've seen it also, is when we were looking at um, the whole um, the the docu series on Netflix VAR and their episode about. How Jaws created this whole. We're still chasing you know, Jaws all these years later. It's like a kid. It's this impossible that, you know, benchmark we're never going to be able been, to beat. You know, the the point of it has been changed, so people haven't really grasped how to create this into another film like that, right? Uh, so I, you know, I think it's a it's a fair point. I mean, I feel like Creature Features, you know, if you're comparing to Jaws, has has definitely changed a lot as well, right? But that's you know, definitely. But you think about it, and you know, like I said, I know this sounds crazy for Spielberg fans, but I think that, in my opinion, I feel like even Spielberg mm. himself wouldn't be able to create Jaws again in this day and age, you know, and in the sense that these movies come and they, they're kind of like a once in a lifetime opportunity, and then you grasp it and it happened, and now to up that, how I think do you with Jaws, up that, it's... right? It's I'm like, not saying Spielberg hasn't had good movies. He's it's 50% Spielberg's skills of directing, 50% all great. the pieces uh, falling into place. But at the same time, like, every yeah, director right starts cast. going on a he downward slope He tinkered the hell well. out of that movie. And, you know, like, with the, the head, you know, the that, seven head scene. That's obviously, like, if we do a Spielberg he tinker, season, He kept tinkering and tinkering with it just to see if he could get, like, the popcorn flying higher each time. The fact the shark constantly broke down when they were filming it so that he was referring it to as the great white turd. There's all these different uh, elements of it that, you know, it may not have happened. The fact that if you filmed it directly yeah. like Bench, uh, Peter Benchley's book, it would have been awful because Benchley's book is about people and the shark is this sort of background presence. And again, we look at that cast. That cast is absolutely spawned for every single one of those characters. We know them, these characters because <laughs> of the people who played them and the way that they played them. So, um, yeah, it's... It, it's... Uh, it's certainly like a one that we, maybe we just need to take Jaws apart, not just do Spielberg, but just take Jaws and try and figure out figure out that will be our show of choice and why Jaws two is arguably better. That will be the discussion piece. One last thing I want to raise up and again it's back to Jerry O'Connell's character. He's based as we say, he's based on Joe's Girls Gone Wild, um, Joe Francis. Joe Francis was fine with them doing a parody of he took offense to was the fact that the character is <laughs> that, like that's gonna be a shark choice and filming underage girls which he said you know wasn't him this wasn't <laughs> helped by the fact that jerry o'connell kept going around saying i'm playing joe francis in this movie to which joe francis decided to ward him off with legal action 
to which again Jerry O'Connell to his credit says uh, we go around saying I play Joe Francis. Oh wait, for legal reasons, I'm supposed to say I play someone loosely based on Joe Francis. I think uh, Piranha 3D. It's the 3D elements do take away from this movie. The elements where it's been changed back to free from 3D to 2D. They're very obvious, as is always the case with these 3D movies. Um, as are the scenes where it's things coming at the cameras. Uh, but if you buy the DVD, you can get um you get two discs and you get the 2D version and you get a crappy 3D version and they even got like some cardboard 3D specs in there as well and it's as crappy as you think it would but it's a nice throwback I guess <laughs> yeah oh definitely <laughs> Oh yeah, don't watch this in HD. Yeah, but you know, I mean, I, I still yeah, feel like Yeah, do not like watch this that, in HD you know, because those I watched, lines become I watched old it, more I rented it so and it present. was like Piranha. If you watch it, it in standard, 3D, you can just about get away with it. But you can still see where the 3D yeah, shots were. But yeah, watch it in HD. Because you can really those see, because those really are the ones chill. where you really have those like really hard hitting um, And I didn't notice how bad some of the CGI was until you pointed it out. I was in my own little... It's for the it's for the 3D and I was like, oh, this is great CGI. And then I looked at it, it's like, no, some of this is pretty rough. <laughs> so, thanks for breaking that glass ceiling, Kim. <laughs> uh, it'd be fine, like when they're in a shoal or something. But then again, you have like one like there's um one of the piranhas just in the boat on its own. It's like, oh, that's that's not good. <laughs> Um, and then it, then they show that same piranha in a tank, and it's like, oh, that looks really good. <laughs> so it's it it comes and goes. There's no rhyme, no reason to to uh, making it work. But yeah, for myself, it's still a really fun time. Um, so I gave this a solid five stars. But uh, Kim Kim was not so generous. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You did, so, but uh, oh really? I thought he was gonna say, "Oh, fire stars for this." <laughs> I'm sure he was. Let's, let's, <laughs> and let's, then let's, mine was half of yours, one, I think. Uh, <laughs> mine oh, was really? about half. I put, I gave it three, I think. I'm just giving a well, my husband was like, "You're giving it three. Yeah, I, I would give it two point five, you know." <laughs> so, but uh, yeah, that's um, Prada three D. Uh, he was harsher than me. He was like, "Fantastic." But uh, yes, it's a uh, verbal to rent. Considering, considering he started falling asleep features. at one part, and I was like, "I was like, this is a creature um, feature. What are you falling asleep for?" Thank you, as always, for listening. If you haven't already, please do hit the like and subscribe button wherever you happen to listen to us. You can follow us on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter. Come say hi to us. Let us know what your thoughts on Piranha movies are. Let us know what you think about creature features. No, you can also check out our blog, which is uh, moviesandteapodcast.wordpress.com, which has got our full archive of episodes, everything from Paul W. S. Anderson and Sofia Coppola, even through to Guillermo del Toro and Ang Lee, including, uh, most recently, our season of Kick-Ass Female Direct, so plenty to check out on there including our Friday Film Club where every Friday myself and Kim both pick a film to highlight sometimes it's a theme, sometimes it's not but either way it's a chance to talk about more of the movies that we love but Kim, where are we going to next on our Creature Feature season? Yep, um, our first found footage creature feature. Um, this is a movie I've been told as a movie to watch if you want to squirm. Uh, it's going to be a first time watching myself, so I'm very excited about that as well. well but that's obviously coming up well, on you our it next before. episode. We're going to but uh, until then, thank uh, you for, for listening. Thank you for my Kim. And we'll be back next time feature to talk feature. about <laughs> The Bay. The Bay. Until then, good night. <laughs>